Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Education. This is the multiple special meetings we've had and will have left later this week. Um, with uh, just, I'd ask the folks in the audience to please turn off cell phones before we begin. And with that, I'll ask the Secretary to call the roll. Gladly. President Wasserman? Here. Vice President Baker? Here. Secretary Kaminsky? I'm here. Treasurer Brandstamp? Here. Member Gordon? Here. Member McFarland? Is absent. Member Vanderkellen? Here. Six to seven. Thank you. And Scott did tell us he would be absent last meeting. Yep. Uh, with that said, right. uh, yep. with that said, if you folks would uh, join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance to begin the meeting. I pledge allegiance, I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone, and thank you who participated in honoring our fallen service people over the weekend. Uh, very meaningful to me, and uh, we have a former service member sitting at our table. So thank you for your service, John. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move into the consent agenda. Tonight's consent agenda has several items, approval of our budget workshop uh, minutes, um, uh, recommend renewal of an adult ed cooperative agreement we've had for many years between the schools and the county, uh, a textbook examination period that began on IBAP, and now we are seeking approval. The uh, one staff member paraprofessional retirement, Approval of assistance bills for the month of March and April as listed in the agenda. And also a listing of the purchase orders exceeding $3,000 and the purchase card transactions. A oh, resignation, I'm sorry, thank you, uh, for $3,000. Uh, I'll accept the motion on the consent agenda. Or I ask first, is there any additions or deletions anybody cares to make? Seeing none, motion. I move we accept consent agenda item 2.1 through 2.5C. Support. Moved by Treasurer Branson, support by Secretary Kaminsky. Any discussion or questions? Seeing none, we'll move in a vote. All, all approving say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. At this point, if anyone in the audience would care to address the board, uh, please come forward. Uh, limit your comments to five minutes and please tell us the school attendance area in which you reside. Seeing none, we'll move on to presentations to the board. Um, the first folks we have here are sitting in the front gallery, several of the board members, and superintendent of the Midland County Educational Service uh, Agency is here to talk about the next year's budget. Well, thanks for the opportunity to talk about our budget for next year. I am joined by three of our board members, President Paula Renker, Vice President Felix McElroy, and Trustee Amory Hawkins. I'm also joined by our CFO, Duane, Duane Ryle from the firm of Andrews, Hooper, and Pavlik. We, uh, we have put a lot of work into this budget, and I'm sure you have seen and read the information that's come to you. So Duane will make a short presentation. And then I'll be happy to answer any of the questions that arise. So, Dwayne? Thank you. Appreciate being able to be here tonight. I'd like to preface the remarks by saying that when we go through the process, uh, we, we go through quite a rigorous process. But as I've told the other locals, I, I go through this process personally wearing kind of one of three hats, some of them all at the same time. Uh, one hat, as a, as a board member of a local school for St. Charles, I you know, last week we approved the, our board's uh, budget for the intermediate school district. So I look at it from as a fiduciary looking at the budget for how it, Im how it impacts the schools. So I sometimes wear that hat. I'm also an auditor of schools, so I look at it from a, a challenging point of view of looking at the assumptions, looking at the at the rigor that goes into the amounts and, and try to look at that with an independent eye, but also, also with, a, um, with a view toward making, making sure that it's transparent. And I also look at it from the point of view of a CFO of an organization because within the organization, the conversations that we have uh, 
first and foremost, always focused on how to best serve the, the kids in the county, how to serve best the locals, and then how to, how to serve our uh, entity overall. So I, I say I wear kind of one or sometimes all of those hats in that process. And I bring that up so that you can better understand the context with which we approach the budget. Because I think sometimes that, you know, that, that is helpful. <clears throat> A couple of notes on the uh, presentation of the budget itself. Uh, it's, uh, it's expanded from what you saw last year. The, the format's very similar, but there are more line items. And we, we did that for a couple of reasons. One, to increase transparency. Uh, two, to better align with, uh, with how we report to our ESA board and how we report to the locals as, as part of our tuition and distribution of Act 18. We're trying to get those, uh, kind of all three of those parts aligned, and, and this, this budget uh, al does align with that. Uh, in particular, one of the areas that last year was consolidated was the area of added needs for special education. So we've expanded those into the eligibility areas to show uh, the, you know, the different programs that we have. And as a result of that, you're going to see a lot, some of the amounts from the prior year don't have amounts because they were consolidated. So we, we wanted to present it, present the budget as you saw it last year, and then as you're seeing it this year, we, you know, the number of ways we could present it, but we thought that was probably the, the, most, uh, the most transparent. The other area that we expanded uh, because of a change in the program uh, relates to the community, uh, community projects area. In particular, the GSRP, or Great, Great Start Readiness Program. Uh, we formed a consortium with, uh, with other counties, and we're the, the lead institution for that. And we received the GSRP funds from the state, and then administered those programs to the different vendors and programs throughout the, the multi-county multi dist uh, consortium district. And we've shown, because that is a very large uh, bump up in, in revenue, it's about a $4 million increase in revenue and then a, a large increase in the budgeted expenses, we've shown that as a separate category within the general fund. So GSRP has been broken out from the other co community project uh, areas within the general fund. So those are probably the most significant changes. A few more subtle changes that you'll notice is that there, there may be some salaries and benefits in one year and, and not in the next year. And in some areas, it, 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 um, it, it'll have zero amounts and positive amount. And what we did in going through this process is really took a hard look at where people were assigned from a functional area. And we found that uh, in, in some cases, people based on what they did might be uh, assigned to one or one or more different functional areas, and we tried to look at what's the best functional area, and we did that so that going forward we'd have even more consistency. So you're you're going to see some areas that look like variances this year, but in reality, or more often than not, it's going to be a reclassification from one function to another. So that those are some uh, some highlights. The funds, I'll go through these pretty quickly. These have not changed from the prior year as far as the, the, the funds that we have. Of course, the capital projects fund this next year will wind down with the completion of the Longview Early Childhood Center. Uh, general fund departments and programs. Uh, this is consistent with what we've had as, as well. Uh, those, those are in your slides, so I won't uh, do that in detail. Special education programs, this is a, is a recap of what we had, and that's consistent with last year as well. General fund comparative summary. The, uh, the blue line is really the result of the consortium payments for the GSRP payments, which is why the revenue is so high and the expenses are so high. What I will highlight, and we'll have a better graphic uh, a little later on in the slides, is that the fund balance is, you know, we are pulling that, uh, that down, and we're doing that in the general fund as well as the special revenue fund, or the special education fund. 
At the same time we're pulling that down, we're really looking at a lot of ways to reduce costs more, and in many ways we have done that. Uh, costs that we've spent, we're trying to invest in, in areas that can reduce costs overall over the long term. So we try to take a long term view, but at the same time we recognize that uh, cash flow being what it is, we need, we need to be mindful of uh, getting as much back to you as we can. Special education, uh, you'll see a similar similar thing. What you'll notice in the middle bar, which was last year's budget, the differential between the revenue and the expenses was greater than what it is. And what we're trying to do with special education, our goal is to bring that down so that it's more of a break-even, uh, a break-even cash flow, and break-even expenses and revenue. And that, that uh, we will not get that uh, this year. This shows the fund balance percentage trend, and you can uh, you can see that for the projected amount for 2013-14 is about a little more than 12 percent. Uh, that's a, probably about where it where it should be. Uh, a lot of guidance will say 15 percent. That tends to be a little unrealistic now. I think that's probably an ideal amount. I think 12 percent is still okay. And then for the special education fund, that has been a concern, and I want to highlight an anomaly in the 11-12 year and, and why that is so high. One of, the, uh, one of the processes that we go through is to estimate tuition, which, is, which would be the, the, the cost of the special education programs, and then the flow of the Act 18 property tax distribution back to the locals. So there's two calculations. There's an estimate, and for budgeting purposes, we use that estimate for the uh, tuition invoices that are sent to the local and also the checks that we write to the local. And in the 2011-12 year, that normally is closed out um, earlier. That had not been done uh, previously. Uh, that was all caught up in this last in this last fall. And we made, uh, I think it was a million ninety-five thousand uh, dollar payments uh, to the locals. So in, in reality, this, uh, uh, this is going to even out over and what we've done in 2013, and what we've done for uh, 2013 and 14 is bring that down uh, a little further. We've, we're trying to meter that down. Uh, what we don't want to happen is to have a, a large, uh, a large payment out that would reduce that fund balance too low, which then would not allow us flexibility in being able to. Uh, for example, add new classrooms should that be needed, because that can be quite an expensive proposition if there are a lot of children with special needs that come into the district. So, you know, we're, we're working with all the districts to make sure that that's kind of right-sized, if you will. This is a recap of what you see on the, on the budget and then the percentage revenue sources. This is for the general fund and then the expenses, of course, the, the largest uh, largest uh, portions are the community services and that would include the Longview Early Childhood Center. Enhancement millage is a pass-through, so that, that's revenue and all of that revenue that comes in flows out to all of the locals. Special education fund, uh, variety sources, property taxes, uh, federal sources. For federal grant purposes, we've, we've assumed that there would, there's still going to be a continued reduction in that grant amount for the current year. Uh, realistically, I don't see that that amount would increase. We would always like to see that it would, but I, I don't think that's uh, realistic to expect that. Uh, Interdistrict sources, <coughs> those would include tuition payments and contracted, contracted services that we bill out to other locals and in some cases other ISDs. And then the expenditures, obviously, instruction and supporting services. Uh, supporting services and instructions would be teachers, paraprofessionals, itinerants uh, for specialized services and so forth. Okay. Now, the, uh, one of the uh, items that I've handed out is a, is a chart that shows the uh, special education and total student count. And this is based on the February counts. And this is really intended to show the, the general trend. Um, now, this trend is not unique to this county. Uh, it's 
not even unique to Michigan, but it does show a general downward trend in the general student population. At the same time, there's an upward trend in the special education uh, program. Now, the question that we've been asked is that from, in, in the question that I ask as a board member for a local district, is that the number of students going up is generally a, a good thing. It's it positive, we like to see that. Why is that not the case with special ed? And the answer is that the cost for special ed student is greater than the cost of the general education student. So as those, as the costs go up for, uh, or the student population for special ed goes up, those, those costs are gonna go up more in proportion to than the state aid that we would receive. We would receive the same state aid amount. And what we try to do to mitigate that and look, look for ways where we can reduce those costs. In fact, if we look at what charted, don't have this in the material, but our gross, our, on average, our gross cost per special ed student for the, that's passed through to the district has been declining. I think there's um, maybe one area that, ha that has gone up slightly, but that's an area that we're tracking as well. Federal funds that we receive, state aid that we receive, um, reimbursement for contracted services we receive all go against that cost to help keep the cost down. So the back uh, part of that sheet shows, uh, shows a graph that shows ages, in some cases young, young adults because we serve the population up to age 26, and then what the mean population was as of 2011, this is for Michigan, but it tracks fairly well for most districts. So you can see that in 2011, the number of, of children that were at that one year age range was significantly lower than what you'd see at 18, which just means that the number of kids entering school is, is kind of lower and lower, which means the trend we looked at on the front would be expected to continue. So I think special ed, Student counts can go up for a number of reasons. It can go up because of people moving into the district. We have a very strong district and provide good services. That's part, part of the reason. Uh, another part of the reason is maybe more precision in being able to identify needs in, in children who require special needs. Um, I think with that, I will kind of pause and let you ask, ask uh, questions that you may have. Mm -hmm. I do. Lord's pleasure. John. Yeah, the, um, I was looking towards in the budget assumptions for 2013-2014, mm -hmm. in the back under other factors, um, the number of students per classroom, no changes plan, number of teachers per student. You'll probably have more um, more student population as far as the special ed goes. Yes. And so what ha how does that drive, how does that influence uh, full-time equivalents as far as the ESA? Mm -hmm. Like this year, this coming year compared to? Uh, previous years? In, in the classroom, based on the state regulations, a, a, a classroom has uh, certain requirements for maximum size, mm -hmm. and then the the ra ratio of the of the instructions to the student. Mm -hmm. So if we have if we have a classroom that has capacity that can absorb some of that flow, but what happens as it increases, it it remains over a relevant range fairly flat, and then you see a, a bump up if if the number of students uh, exceeds that, um, that maximum for a classroom. And then we would be talking about adding a classroom and adding paraprofessionals. Mm -hmm. and, that, uh, and adding a classroom can be expensive. It's, you know, John's gonna have a little better uh, uh, mm -hmm. explanation as far as what that can range, but that could be, you know, a hundred, that could be 100,000, it could be several hundred thousand, depending on the type of classroom. Uh, and then, of course, that, to answer your question, that would also then drive the full-time equivalents because we would, we would uh, perhaps have to add another teacher along with the benefits. And then, and then as far as, so I think as you have more students, you're gonna probably get a few more sections, which drives what you're talking about as far as the instructor. Uh, as far as paraprofessionals, any difference in the way that is being done uh, for uh, the coming year compared to, or how's that track against previous years? It's certainly a relevant question. Um, moving back just a second, the, uh, the number of classrooms that we have is expanding by one, but I'd like to point out that three or four years ago, we actually closed down one classroom for kids with autism spectrum disorder. 
And so in the past three years, we've been able to manage without that classroom, saving all of the locals and obviously the county significant dollars. But the number of kids that are either moving in or being identified with ASD is increasing disproportionately to the rest of the population, right? So that um, has become necessary for us to increase one FTE in the area of ASD. For, and that's in included in this current budget. And, and John, let me just add that that's with the full knowledge and discussion with the county soups. Sure. I mean, we saw that come, and that's just a good move that I think is supported throughout the whole county. It's just something we have to do. Part of, part of what Carl's talking about is also the discussion between the special ed directors and in our shop to take a look at how we are structured across the county in terms of the programming. And so we've done some significant shifting of basically how, how kids are being serviced in various programs. And that has also allowed us to stay uh, fairly, uh, fairly flat in terms of the FTE that we have. And now this year, of course, we had have to do some expansion. Part of that is because of the number of the post-secondary population that continues to grow exponentially. You remember that a few years ago, the, the graduation requirements changed significantly, which causes the population to be really unable to graduate like they have been in the past. And so we see that that number of kids in that 18 to 26 population growing very quickly. And so we did some restructuring and we're, we're, we're making some really significant changes to the post-secondary programs that we offer over the next year. And with a mind to not only servicing kids better, but also looking at how we're going to be able to control costs. I'll jump back to your question. Mm -hmm. in, in terms of the paraeducators, we've been doing a lot of research into how we can better serve kids, but also at the same time reduce the number of paraeducators in classrooms, okay? Because right now we have a model that's nearly uh, one to one. And part of that model is, is effective because of the fact that our kids go out into the regular classrooms. So we have the investment in making sure that kids are able to participate in uh, a typical type of educational experience um, as much as possible. And that's what, you know, that's what we are in Midland County are dedicated to, to providing. So it's very important that when we look at increased numbers, increased costs, and shrinking dollars, that we do that in a most effective way. And so we're looking at how are we a number of the things that we've been offering, for for example, completely um, customized professional development for all of our employees. That goes to not, not throwing out blanket professional development, but it goes to specifically meeting the needs of every individual with the focus on becoming a better team. If you become a better team in a classroom, you can actually reduce the number of people that are in that classroom, the number of adults in the classroom. And we've been able to do that systematically, and over the next three years, we plan to reduce the number of paraeducators proportionally by about 20, 21 people. Now, 21 people is about a half a million dollars. So if you, if you think about the, plan, the planning and the professional development, all of these factors going into uh, providing higher quality service, then that number of FTE is, is going to be shrinking. I think Duane mentioned in, in at least one of the papers in, a, in an analysis of the budgeted hours, um, we are actually down about five teachers, and here it listed as about three. And it, it really depends on whether it's a paraeducator or an administrator or a teacher. But we have been very conscious about trying to rein in costs wherever possible. You'll notice what Duane said is that we're trying to search out that magic number of what the fund equity ought to be. Well, at the same time, we're trying to make sure that as we bring down costs, increase services, right? So services are increasing costs are yet we're bringing those down so that somewhere we're going to meet at hopefully that zero point. Well, it may not be possible to meet at a break even. So that's, you know, my colleagues and I continue to have the discussion about what is that going to look like in the future? Will we need some kind of a special education millage countywide to help offset the costs? That's something that has to be on the table and part of our conversations. It might not be the next year or two, but down the road if, con if costs continue to outstrip revenues that will be a serious consideration or have to be a serious consideration because th what we're talking about are not frills we're talking about mandated services for kids in Midland County 
another thing that I'd like to talk about, switching back to the post-secondary. You don't mind if I go on another half hour? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks. So the, uh, one of the, the positions that's included in this budget is a new position called the Director of Vocational Enterprises. The Director of Vocational Enterprises is going to be a position that works to develop micro-enterprises within the county to help do a number of things. One, to help kids get better training so that they can go off and be productive members of society, right? So they can hold real jobs. The other part of that is to create these micro-enterprises which will generate an income. And that income will help to offset the costs. So we have the plan. One of the first things that we're doing is with the food service at Longview. So Longview is going to serve about 300, 350 kids a day. And they're all, not all, but you know, they're shifts, but we're going to need to serve breakfast, lunch, snacks. And those kids are going to, are part of what, a new partnership that we're forming is with one of our charter schools, Windover, and their culinary arts program is to provide food service for the kids at Longview. And that will actually be a, a, a small money maker, but one that will help to offset costs of this director position and also the added students that we're going to be serving. So in the post-secondary program, it's a growth of about 20 kids countywide in the coming year. And we project that that will only continue, another 20 kids and another 20 or 30 kids year after year. So we have to be really cognizant of the fact that those costs are really going to outstrip revenues. So what can we do now in terms of planning for the future that are going to help us to control those costs, but truly about providing better service to kids? A couple of other things just to put in your head is that we're, we're working on a partnership with a company, or a local group called Bicycle Recycle. And that group is, is going to be working with us to provide training for kids that may be able to go and work in bike shops. And that's a, an amazing relationship that we're, we're working on right now. Another relationship with the community center, we're looking at providing some food service there so people can come in, have lunch, and or have a birthday party or whatever it is, and have the food right there at the community center. And I think that'll be a great benefit for the community, but also a tremendous benefit for kids who will be able to work in, in that kind of a situation and learn more about what it takes to be um, maybe, a, maybe cooking, maybe cleaning, those kinds of things in, in food service. So hopefully that answers your question, and maybe a few more that you didn't even think of. Are there any other questions that any board members have? I have a trend sure. question. You probably can't answer it, but I've got to answer it. Ask it. Mm -hmm. As you talked about the inexorable trend we're seeing where um, a higher percentage of the population needs special services. Yes. But our population is shrinking. Mm -hmm. Yet the one is outpacing the other mm -hmm. right now by the 20 students you mentioned and you see on your papers. What would be your forecast going forward? Is that trend going to keep continuing where a higher percentage of students would need special services? I know we're all talking about the autism thing and, and that everybody kind of sits there and sees that trend that's happened in the rearview mirror to get us here. What's, what's, what are professionals saying about where that's going forward? Well, many professionals are saying that that trend is going to continue. And that's a bit unnerving, right? Very unnerving. So. I think that some of the, the thought in, in our organization is looking at how, how is it that we can provide better services sooner. So for example, with the post-secondary program, if we can provide services that make sense for a kid to be able to move into a new situation where they're able to earn money and live on their own, they have more independence, before that age of 26, that is, is good for all of us involved, right? But in order to be able to move in that direction, we have to try. We have to develop programs that are interesting to kids. We have to develop programs that pay a living wage. And, and then also work in partnership with other organizations in the community to, to be able to transition kids into learning how to live alone or learning how to live with some kind of added support. We do that pretty well here in Midland County, but I think we're going to have larger numbers of kids that we need to be focusing on in, in providing that kind of transition service. I think that this, this new position, this new you know, wing or development that we, we're working on is going to help um, provide better service for kids, but also I think provide that hopefully at an earlier age so that we can kind of transition kids sooner and hopefully save some money that way too. John, is that 60000 total cost compensation for that position? No, that's a salary cost. The total cost is what, around ninety. 
Okay. And we expect that within the, the first year, year and a half, we'll be able to offset those costs completely. And eventually that will be a totally funded position. And then uh, I remember when we launched the post-secondary program that for the last mm -hmm. couple of years has been over in Northwood. And, right. you know, there were representatives from the local districts that came and talked to the county superintendents. I remember a comment being made at that meeting that it was hoped that just because we launched the program that every student in it wouldn't necessarily have to stay until the age of 26. Mm -hmm. So I like what you're doing to support those students in other ways so maybe you can save in terms of dollars, and I don't like to look at it just in terms of dollars, but really having students prepared to exit that program maybe a couple of years early. Um, what mindset, though, do you see now of parents who have their children entering that program? Are, are they coming to it thinking that it's going to be there through the age of uh, when they turn 26? Because I know some of our community agencies that some of those families rely on for services will sometimes say to them, don't exit that program early because they can help you with resources that supposedly the school has that they don't. Mm -hmm. So what kind of mindset do you see parents have as they approach that program? Right now, I think the mindset is is one of transition, frankly, because of we're moving two of our programs, two of our post-secondary programs, one at Town Center and the other at Northwood, both back to the Sugnet site and increasing that program because of numbers, right? So while we're only adding one teacher, we're doing some shifting around so that we'll have three post-secondary classrooms. Uh, like I said, I think it is, there is, some, there is some hesitancy because many parents wanted to have this vision of having their kid on a, a, a college campus. And we're working through that to try to make sure that kids will still have a variety of experiences, but also at the same time have other experiences that may provide them with that needed fit for their post-secondary training that they can move to the next, whatever that next phase is. So, you know, we're planning to bring a number of other programs and, and training programs back to the set or to the Sugnet site so that the kids will have a, a larger or a broader range of experiences or opportunities for experience. They, they won't all experience them. It'll be based on interest. I want to applaud the efforts you're taking to reduce those costs. And what I'd like to say to your board members in attendance is, I think people in this community see you as, a, see you as real strong leaders and advocates for our special needs population. And I guess what I would ask you to think about is how can you leverage that to help the local districts and your own organization to have the community view services in the area of special ed a little different than historically we have been able to um, I don't want to say in a luxurious manner, but it's not common for ESA programs necessarily when those youngsters are mainstream to have a one-on-one -on -one parapro for every student. That I think is more uncommon than it's common. Mm -hmm. And I think if the community saw that kind of um, um, advocacy for that population and leadership from your board, that helps the locals in trying to streamline cost and you would continue to be the key leaders because the community would see that we're trying to use our resources differently. Mm -hmm. And I think you could lead that. All right, thanks. Any other questions? John, have you done any studies on uh, early intervention with autism at age two or three and now that you'll be doing early childhood program, do you think that that's going to have a positive impact on special needs children? It certainly has a positive impact. You know, that every child is so different. Um, they have the cause and effect is is very different for each child. Um, we see some kids who respond very early, uh, what, no matter what their label is, to early intervention. And some kids, because of severity or because of the particular nature of the disability, have ver have a slower response. But the interesting thing is, there's always that hope, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what I've been so surprised by, not that I don't have hope for kids, it's just that some sometimes you see that there's no, you don't see growth and then all of a sudden you see this tremendous growth for, for a child. And that's what, what, you know, the dream that I have is that every, every child's educational program, I mean every child, every child in Midland County, their educational program is as customized as the kids that are in the programs that are offered by the ESA. Because every child develops so differently, right? Mm -hmm. And you, those interventions and the, the treatments, whatever they are, um, whether it's a regular ed student in a classroom learning to read or learning math, 
or whether it's in an ESA program, delivering that customized approach like we're doing to our employees is, is really a, showing a tremendous growth. The potential is only added to when you take that approach, I believe. And I think we have the, the data to support that. Uh, we, are, we are fundamentally changing the way that we think about teaching and learning at the ESA. And just by way of example, um, I've noticed, and understand that this is my, I've just completed my second year at the ESA, and I don't have a strong background in special education. So I come in and I walk around and I look at programs and I make observations that other people with the, the training don't make. I ask a lot of questions that some would say are kind of stupid questions, but they're not necessarily stupid to me because I don't know the answer. And so we, we've, the point that I'm getting at is that rather than a lot of times what I've, what I've observed in other ISDs and in our own programs is that we're, we see the way that we're managing behaviors so that we're getting kids to do something and not necessarily learn it and internalize it. And so we're systematically changing instruction so that we address learning needs more than behavioral needs because they are very much linked with one another. You provide a higher quality instructional program and behavior problems are reduced. And that doesn't matter whether it's in a, a regular ed classroom or a special education classroom, right? So those kinds of changes, when I'm talking about personnel, the number of personnel, when I'm talking about educational changes, program, those things take time. And again, we're just kind of in our infancy here. So, But look forward to uh, continued changes <coughs> and growth in the programs and the service <coughs> to kids. So any other questions? John? John? Any, anything that keep you keeps you up at night, uncertainties, things that I know you got some trends here, but I know we, we have our own, of course, with the public school district, but anything that is just uh, maybe is uncertain that's hard to predict trend-wise or? Well, if I worried about everything, I wouldn't sleep at all, <laughs> right? Yes, <laughs> but federal requirements or something, because it's uh, there are some There are some really big issues, I think, and you're probably dealing with the same ones, such as the Affordable, in quotations, uh, CARE Act. That is a, a significant challenge for us, and I think we have I think we have a plan to mitigate the the problems that are caused by you know trying to offer health care to every employee and doing it at a way in in such a way that is cost neutral to the to the organization. Now that's again part of a three year plan, so it's going to take some time to get there, but I believe that we can we can achieve that. So that's that's a serious challenge. I think another challenge is just the sheer numbers of kids, like increasing population on one hand, decreasing population on the other hand. And you know, when when we have we have one large school district and three smaller school districts, trying to meet the needs of everyone is is a challenge. But I think that that is something that we have to continue to be up for and continue moving ahead keeping our options open for how we can think differently, look differently at, at shared services and continue to work together. So there are, you know, challenges abound, but this is what we do, right? Or at least for a few more days. <laughs> <laughs> We're up to the challenges. Thank you. Others? Any, any other questions or comments? Well, thanks. We really appreciate the opportunity to share the budget with you and hope that you'll take our recommendation and, and, and vote positively for that tonight. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to cover a couple more items and come to the sure. vote on your budget. So, yeah, you. Okay. And uh, board members, thanks for coming up. Okay, we'll move to item 4.2 with uh, Mr. Cooper talking about Smarter Balance Assessment Pilot. All right, well, good evening. Um, as you may know, it's been in the news a lot lately here, just today, in fact. Um, the State of Michigan Assessments, which would be the MEEP and the MME, as we like to call them, are scheduled to change in the spring of 2015. Um, they're going to change to a test that's developed by Smarter Balance, which is really just a consortium of states that are writing the test. And those tests are going to reflect the Common Core State Standards. Up until now, 
it's really been this coming to a school near you soon, but soon is now. And in fact, we just finished with four of our schools that were selected um, based on their demographics uh, by the Smarter Balance uh, Consortium to actually take the test, the first uh, pilot test of the, of the Smarter Balance. And they recently participated. In fact, the, the last school just finished up here just before the Memorial Day weekend. So we had four schools that uh, participated. So what I wanted to do tonight was just give you a brief update of the Smarter Balance Assessment itself, uh, the recent pilot, lessons we learned, and kind of our next steps as we go forward in the process. Okay, first, the four schools, just for your information, that got chosen were East Lawn. They had a grade three in math and a grade four in ELA. Uh, Dow High School in grade 10 ELA, that's kind of an unusual one because typically we test in grade 11. But as they are trying to figure out, uh, and I'll talk about it, that the test is computer adaptive, which means it will adjust to students as they take it, easier, harder questions based on how you're answering. And so they need to get some uh, numbers and grades uh, above and below just so that they can have that information for their test. Northeast was grade seven math, and Woodcrest ended up doing math in grades three and in four. What is Smarter Balance? Well, it's a consortium of states. And so, you know, I just got the map out here. It's always changing because some states belong. There are two major consortiums. Uh, the Smarter Balance one, 24 states, 40% of the students are in that one. The other one's Park. And there are some states that uh, don't want to belong to either of them. And, uh, you know, some states are in both. The only difference in color as you're looking at is their green are the governing states and the blue are the advisory states. At one time that was a bigger deal, but you'll notice there's a lot more governing states now. But at one time, uh, a lot of the schools that hedged their bets and were in both were, were the advisory states, and so they didn't have full, full membership in there. In an ideal world, you know, what kind of test is Smarter Balance going to be? And that's, I took the slide right from their website. But basically what you'll see is um, the Smarter Balance test will be online. It will be given in the last 12 weeks of the year. Uh, how that's actually going to work, we don't know, but we know it's going to be in the last 12 weeks. They're going to have a test that I mentioned earlier is called computer adaptive. And computer adaptive is, is a test where you would take the question and based on how you answered it, it would give you an easier question that or harder question so that we really can pinpoint the level that you're operating at. Not in big general categories, but we'll be able to specifically know uh, your level of knowledge and skill at that point in time. The other thing it's going to do since there's technology involved is allow us to look at a lot of different types of problems that don't easily get answered on a bubble in uh, multiple choice test. And they can range from more open-ended questions, which we got away from because the cost of grading those is high. And you might say, well, how Smarter Balance going to do more open-ended constructed response questions? They're going to use artificial intelligence to grade some of the tests when they come through, which is a scary thought. But by the same token, um, I've seen the reliability studies that would tell you that, um, and they've you know done it both ways with uh, human scores backing these up, so they know that they're the same, and they found them they're highly, highly effective in grading that way. Interesting, but it's one of the ways they're going to go. Other types of problems are things like the performance tasks. A performance task would be a um, set of problems, more than just one question, but a bigger task to go through. It might even include a classroom activity, followed up by some research on their part, and then solving a series of questions and, and applying what they've learned in that session. The other two things you see on here, I guess there's really three I should point out to you, they are talking about having a retake option, which is very interesting. In the last 12 weeks, a student could take it a second time. Um, they didn't tell us if we would get the results back first before you had them do that, but if you had a student, even if they didn't know the results, and you knew it was a bad day when they took that test, you would have the option of retesting. And you'll see some other parts here. Um, the digital library and these optional interim assessments are, the interim assessments, I'd have you picture those as like pre, mid, post tests helping you judge as you go through your instruction where you're at before you got to the big summative test at the end. Um, those computer, uh, the, excuse me, these optional uh, interim assessment ones would be online also. Um, there's a couple of things there I guess I'd point out to you. They're either going to be like little mini Smarter Balance tests or they will be on particular subject areas. So you could use either type when they're finished developing them. The digital library is exactly what it says up there. They would be tools for you to use both in helping you with your instruction and what the kids are expecting the test, how things are going to be scored, um, all kinds of professional development resources. And those are all plans as part of that consortium putting them out there. 
course, it all comes about because if you have the same common core state standards running across, y you can get together with the 24 states and, and develop those. Anything that you don't see there, for example, you'll notice common core is only ELA and math. That means that the state of Michigan will fill in the rest of those. So the science and the social studies, their part of the common core is more in the area of informational reading and writing, but their objectives are not going to come from um, the common core. Uh, science is working on something called next generation science standards, different organization, but putting those out. And social studies is uh, C3, and I wish I could remember what the three Cs are, but it just came out. It's in draft form, so that's, that's the ways down the road. Anything you, you don't see there, then the state would fill in. So for example, the state's even working on these little formative assessments down here, these little optional intern ones for K2, or any grade that you don't see them. In fact, um, the social studies test even piloted last year, the state of Michigan in one of the grades, so they've already done some online testing. What it means for Michigan then is the meet becomes the smarter balance test in the spring of 2015. In fact, that's the first thing I should say all spring testing as opposed to right now, grades two through eight is in the fall and the high school follows. In March, we'll switch all the spring testing for all the grades. Um, when I say meet becomes smarter balance, either that or smarter balance is meet, but I don't care which way you look at it, but they're just gonna call it that. Um, the other two at the bottom, the MEEP access and the MY access are for our kids that uh, usually with disabilities that aren't able to take the MEEP test. Um, the MEEP access will also come from uh, Smarter Balance and the MY access, which are our cognitively impaired students. They just have a different company working on that, a different group of states, and they're called dynamic learning maps because they're a different type of test you would use there. The one I have question marks by is the MME. It's an interesting, the high school test is very interesting because it has requirements and the State Board of Education has adopted the Common Core and says we're gonna take the Smarter Balance test there. The legislation has said that as part of the MME, you have to have a college readiness test, which you guys would think of as the ACT, and a career readiness test, which is the work keys part. And they have not, nor do I know if they will, by the time we take that test, worked out that difference. And if that stays in there, then certainly the early things I've heard of is there'll be some kind of combination of the two that students will take. I don't think that means 16 hours of testing, but it might be everything from, um, they can take the ACT on the state's money like on a Saturday or whatever, a normal testing day. But so far those two have not been put together. Their hope is eventually Smarter Balance would be accepted as a college readiness test. But as you would know, not too many people are ready to do that until they see a few years of data to say, yes, that's as predictive as the ACT or the SAT. So that's the one that's the question mark as far as exactly what's that gonna look like for our students. How about the pilot then? When we talk about the Smarter Balance pilots, it was a scientific sample. So our four schools were chosen um, for their demographics. They never tell you which demographics, but they just choose the schools and they let us know which ones they were. It is one of the largest trial runs that they've used for an assessment in the US ever. Um, I had over 500,000 uh, students, it's over 600,000 now, and they're almost finished. 5,000 schools, 21 states, 700 of those in Michigan. Interesting thing here, unlike typical pilot tests where you're testing just the items, one thing that happened is the students themselves, as soon as they finished the test, got surveyed, asked questions about what they thought of the test and different things. And so did the test administrators that gave the test, the ones, the teachers that were doing that. The purpose of the pilot, can't stress enough, enough to you because it's not your typical pilot test like you would think about, not even like the MEEP test. But what it is, is that it was a chance for them to evaluate under real world conditions, both the test items themselves and the online delivery system. And when I mean test items, they were trying a lot of different techniques of how can we use technology and ask questions. Some which I'm sure they'll keep and some which I'm sure they'll get rid of because they didn't get to what they wanted to. So I want you to think of this as the test of the test and not a test of the student. No student results come back. It's really more about the test than the delivery system types of questions that you can ask. And we've kind of mastered the multiple choice. We know how to do that. So when they're looking for items, they're looking for a lot of different things. And the results of that pile of tests then will lead to what's gonna be called the field test. That would be more like your typical test. That field test would be when they're out there pretty sure close to the final product, they wanna to vet out some of the questions they're gonna ask to see if they're appropriate, to get scores so they know how to score the test along the same lines as they do the MEEP and the MME. And it's very likely that some of our schools will get chosen for that pilot in 2014. And we always have to make a decision about do we go ahead and do that or we don't do that, but I would always tell you that 
most of the principals, in fact, all four in our buildings in this case, appreciate they do it because it gives you all a big look into what logistics are going to be involved, what's this going to take. Um, you have teachers, too, that have given it a little less panic in it. And you know, as far as, because remember, they have a, an electronic role now and not just a paper and pencil role, which, you know, our kids are sometimes more comfortable than we are with using the computer. So sometimes it's the test giver that, that needs a little, little more time. But what lessons did we learn? We learned the importance of training the test administrators. We, ta we train all our test administrators, but especially in this case, when we were training the test administrators, um, the, it was a lot up front, more training up front as to how do you get students in the system? How do you start a session? How do you end a session? What are you seeing on your computer screen? Because as a test giver, you've got a computer screen in front of you with all the kids that are taking that test session. So we, we had to do a lot of training. And uh, to be honest with you, some of the early Smarter Balance material wasn't the best training material. Uh, it got better the closer we got, which makes you nervous, though, because you're just about to do it, and now you're finally getting some things that you say, okay, that makes sense. Uh, but there was a lot to learn. Because remember, in the, in the online test, there's a lot built in. I'll use some examples. Um, it's like having a built-in highlighter, for example. So as you're reading, you can highlight if, you, if the students know how to use that tool. They can cross off things that they don't want to see again, even answers and selections. Um, they can even change the font color and the background color because it looks better to their eye. Um, we, you know, that's one of the reasons we have to make sure kids become familiar with online testing. You don't want to spend in the first half hour changing from black to white, white to black, and rose and whatever other colors we had you could put together. And there was a lot of choices. So we wanted to make sure that. But it was really important to get the test admitters trained so they know what they're looking at. Uh, the teamwork of the tech department and the building staffs, we wouldn't even have done the pilot without that. Let me give you a couple quick examples. Um, the students to log in, remember this is third through eighth grade, actually third through tenth grade in this case, have to log in with their full real name, okay, so they can't use a nickname, and they also have to, here's the interesting part, have to go in with their UIC number, which is their unique identifying code, which is 10 digits long. It's not like even an eighth grader has any idea what that number is. Well, the information systems department real quick could write us a program to print it off labels which we could put on index card, which the teachers kept. When they walked in, we gave it to them. We didn't have any problems with any kids logging in third grade uh, or higher, so they did a good job as far as that was concerned, so there was one. Uh, the tech department also sent out a, a tech help desk person to each of the schools the first day they started. One of the things on these uh, online tests, we found they had to have headphones for certain parts, um, not just if they're doing some uh, text-to-speech things, but there were some parts, especially the language arts test, they had to listen. Um, Without the tech people there, one of the things we learned is when they take this test to keep it secure, they send you what's called a secure browser. So picture Firefox or Safari, whatever it is, it's a separate entity. It comes in, you put it on the computer, and that's how the student gets to the test. Well, it said it would lock you out of anything else, so it doesn't let the kid go wandering and, you know, Facebooking you know, or whatever else they should be doing, they're taking the test. We didn't know how far it locked you out until they tried to put the headphones on and listen. It wouldn't even let you get back to the volume. So whatever the volume was set when you went into the test, it kept it there. So I was glad we had a tech person there at the time to figure that out so we could get a kid out of the test and then back into the test. So, so we learned a lot that way. So that helped tremendously on all those things. Uh, the logistics of testing in a larger building in multiple grades. If you noticed in the two, the high school and the middle school, we only tested one grade. Um, they asked us to test in two grades. But when they brought the pilot along, and it's not the real thing, um, and you have limited places to test in, um, that, that made it difficult. So we only asked to test one grade in both of those. Uh, part of that is, and not that we don't have the facilities, but you have to remember that in some of our, especially uh, the bigger buildings, the high schools and the secondaries, they're using that computer labs that are available for instruction. So if you need to use those, you might have to take somebody out of instruction and use the lab. And we just didn't want to do that in a pilot situation. So that would be important to us as we go on, depending on how much computers that we have and how many we can use, um, how we're going to do that. It will, be a logistic, it will be logistically a nightmare sometimes, but I think we can get it done with what we have. It's just a matter of, you know, the more computers we have, the better it would be when we get to those testing situations. Uh, we want to make sure that they're familiar with the technological aspects of online testing, though they're pretty good. You know, the, the dragging and dropping doesn't seem to bother them at all. But there's just a few things like, where do I get my accommodated? How do I move here? Uh, you know, you're moving too fast. Are you really clicking that? Did you save before you move to the next one? There's just things like that. One of the ways that will get answered is um, 
Smarter Balance is going to have a practice test available late May, and they're going to have them by grade level that anybody can get to, including parents. Um, and so we'll have places that we can send students to to get the feel for what that testing environment looks like. And so we'll be doing that. Will the practice be available on my computer? Yes, okay. any computer. Okay. Yep, they haven't decided the portal yet, um, but they're going to try to test a lot of things, and they're going to try to do the multiple grades. Uh, the testing formats even threw us a little bit. Uh, I'll give you two examples there. Um, the MEEP test comes to us, and there are different forms. So, for example, there could be a Form 1 and a Form 7 all on the same test. Uh, they never mix them in class. They tried that one year with paper copies, and it was a nightmare trying to figure out where people were. Well, you can imagine with computers, you can be doing multiple forms and nobody knows it. Okay, so some people are worried that they're sitting next to each other on computers. You're not even looking at the same test. Remember, on top of different tests, different forms, you're also doing computer adaptive, so it's immediately changing as you answer questions. But the pilot part was interesting because uh, not knowing that in advance, some of our teachers were giving that, and we'd find out all of a sudden the student only had 32 questions to do, and the student sat, sat next to him at 37. So it was a little hard to know timing-wise since none of us had done that before, and always had was recommended times how to do that. So that was one of the testing format things. The other was some of the tests had what were called a performance task on it, which I mentioned earlier, a big problem where you have to read a lot, answer some questions, maybe read some more, apply what you're doing there, so it's a bigger type problem. Um, I think we were waiting for it to come in with neon lights, like here's your performance task. It was just part of the test. When you got there, it didn't look much different than another section. It didn't bother the kids, it bothered us more because we kept waiting for the performance task to come on, and by the time we knew it, it was usually a kid telling us that they had answered, uh, you know, that question seemed to take a long time. That's when we knew they had hit the uh, performance test. And then the types and levels of questions our students need to be able to answer. And I think that's more like our most important lesson because the different ways they can ask the questions. Um, I think if you look at Common Core, which leads into these questions, it's not the content that's going to change dramatically for us. It's more an emphasis on the processes, the things that people have to do, what good mathematicians do, what good writers do, what good readers do. Those kinds of practices are going to be important to us. So. Uh, I didn't do anything illegal, but I snapshotted a couple of questions so you could get an idea what Smarter Balance questions look like. So there's one. It was debated whether I should tell you what grade it was first or let you think about it. I'll tell you it's third grade. I'm not going to make anyone answer it, but it's a third grade question. This would be a third grade fraction question. So here's the interesting thing if you look at it, in my opinion. First thing you do, your mind goes to it and say, well, that looks like a standard multiple choice test. But in actuality, it's five problems they're doing and not one. It's not which one is those. It's yes or no on each of those, A, B, C, and D. Um, it's also a problem that deals with fractions, though you see no fractions any place there, but you see a number line representing that with zero, numbers between zero and one. So uh, when you look at that, um, you have to know that. It, you know, most people, when they think fractions, they're thinking pieces of pie or pizza. Everything's circular, so you put it in a number line. So multiple representations. And then the other thing I'd point out to you is if you're a real procedural person, you the real math person that likes everything real procedural. You could figure out what fraction that was, you could figure out all those fractions, and then you could sit there and find out the ones that are equivalent. But here's a case where if we teach the student not only the procedure but the conceptual understanding behind it, something as simple as knowing, and this is a great thing to know about fractions, is it close to zero, is it close to one, is it close to a half? If you take something that simple and you know that, then over here, if you just quickly look at your choices, you're gonna see that I can take some of them right away and say, there's no way that those are close to this. And I might have to do work on one or two, but I don't have to do all of them. Doesn't mean you can't do work on all of them, but that's the kind of processes we're talking about. Students that see patterns, that see multiple representation, that understand we can model things in different ways in the mathematical area. So you're saying in a case like that, there'd be something online where then I could physically online kind of cross through E and cross through C? Yes, yeah, some of them, but what you have is you'd be answering yes or no in this question. So you'd be just quickly going through, and as soon as you knew it was no, you could check that one. Right, so they'll have, like, scratch paper down you here. You can have paper can. if you want it. You so can they're not just line. guessing because they don't have. Yeah, and they have to answer every question. They won't let you go away with one of those not answered. There's a way that was interesting, too. You can put little flags on things. So if you couldn't get it, you could flag it, and that would let you come back. Oh, okay. okay? Um, it doesn't let you come back if you leave and take a break. So if you had to go to the rest of them, you have to have everything finished to that point. Mm -hmm. So they've got all kinds of built-in things. Uh, to keep you going. Again, I stuck with the math question. This is a screenshot, so it didn't all fit, but this is one of the, it's not a performance task, but a little more elaborate, seventh grade. Again, interestingly, a lot of their problems were set up with the left side being kind of uh, 
the body, the part you have to read and understand, and the questions being on the right side. This has to do with uh, online calculators. So if you're on the left side here, they have uh, three calculators, and they're set up online to figure the sales tax for whatever state you're in. So what the student has to do is read that, understand that. They can put in, pick any calculator, many times as they want, any calculator, put in the purchase price, push find the sales tax that fills in this little chart form. Then they have to go to the other side, and they have to take calculator A, B, and C and match it up to the state that that calculator would fit. So again, you can do lots of things, but here's another time where I'd point out to you the processes and the practices. You know, what, what I would tell you is, what are you going to put in for the purchase price? So I put in the right number, it would be pretty clear to me in the sales tax which one of those it is. So for example, if you know percents out of 100, maybe I put in $100, it might just jump right out at me. If I don't think about that, just think 15 is a nice number, <laughs> okay, oh, kick out numbers and I can get through it procedurally, but it'll take me a lot longer. Nothing wrong with that, but it's just, again, hmm. the type of thing that we're trying to look for, thinking critically about what you're looking at. What grade level was that one, Bob? I might seventh have grade. Seventh grade. Yeah. And that would be because of the percents involved. That would be typically the grade. Hmm. But you can see, even though meat questions aren't straightforward problems either, they're, 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 they don't have quite the level of reading and the application that these do. Well, then the last part is the next steps. And so I would tell you that First, we'll continue our professional development with the teaching staff. We've been trying to do that all year long in the different subject areas, but in the Common Core State Standards. In particular, the process skills. And so they're in no particular order. And you can go to fancy names. I could quote you the eight math practices that are there from grades K through eight, uh, 12 that never change. Um, it's uh, the scientific thinking process if you're there. It just depends what you're in. It's 21st century learning skills. But it's about applying what you know. It's about critical thinking. It's about problem solving. In math, I always say that you know there is a place in math for memorization. There's a place in math for procedures. And there's a place to teach kids procedures with connections. Where we really know we have them and where we really have them is when they can do math. Where it's not connected to anything I just did, but it's them taking their knowledge and applying it to something. Same would be true here. Those processes, no matter what happens to the common core. OK, so politically, I can't tell you what would happen with that. These ideas of, that it brings forward of critical thinking, which have been around forever, is not a bad emphasis where we should be. The idea in science and social studies where it's wrapped around uh, informational reading and writing. That's what we need our students to do. I don't care what tests they take. So these are all good skills that are going to come about there. We want to make sure we give students experience with online testing. And we're going to have to work closely with the technology department to meet the technology requirements and capacity. And that's ever changing sometimes. I mean, they've got a pretty good network going, making sure everybody's prepared, but we're going to have to make sure we have the right computers. In fact, we did very well, by the way. And f most of the time when we found a computer that didn't work, uh, it's funny, sitting in a lab, you'd say, well, why didn't that work? We found out later someone knew it didn't work. It wasn't just the test that wasn't working. It had just been sitting there, and we never had the full 30 kids in there at one time, so we didn't know that machine didn't work. So we didn't really find anything technology-wise that wasn't good. I think we maybe found one student. It's the only one I remember. And that was at the high school that no matter how many times we logged them in, it, the system kicked them right back out. <laughs> okay, I'll be glad as a pilot because no one had figured out what that was doing. So that was one of the weird yeah. things we had. But overall, I think it, uh, by doing the pilot, it put them at ease a little bit, especially the people that had to give it. And uh, I think they, it, it's the eye opener is seeing the type of problems that your kids have to answer because that's what you want to prepare them for. And it's not a set of uh, you know, content that you're really preparing for. It's how do I get them to think that way? What, what can I do in my classroom, my instruction, the kinds of tasks I give students to get them there? And that's it. So I'd be glad to take questions if you have any. Oh, I have one. Questions about them. Yes. So have there been any studies yet to look at the correlation between the results they're going to get from this and what they see on the MEEP? Since you, I mean, you're stressing this is like yeah. critical thinking. Are we going to see? Be you know, kids that don't do well on the MEEP are going to suddenly do well on this and vice versa. What I would argue, well, what I would tell you is I think they will do the same thing they did with the MEEP test is they established the career and college, the readiness benchmarks, and then scored the test accordingly. They'll get more of that information on the next big field test, okay. not this one. Okay. Because there, there were just some items that I could tell you if we were watching kids take them. Just, just not well done. I don't mean the type of, just the whole technology involved. There. It's like stretching it too far on a certain things. Or, for example, you saw the one big elaborate problem. And so it's kind of small on the left-hand side, so you could increase it. But lo and behold, when you increased it, guess what? You couldn't see the questions anymore. That seemed kind of backwards to me. 
if you're going to open it up so you can read it, you would think I should still be able to see the questions to know what I'm trying to read for. So I think there's things like that. But that's their intent is the next big field test would allow them to set those standards uh, across all the states that still use the smarter balance. Okay, but even with the standards, could we see a shift in the way kids are testing? Um, I think you could see a shift you know where either way. You're saying higher or lower scores? Well, I'm saying, I mean, you're testing more critical thinking skills. So yeah. the kids that are more rote memorization that might do better now on the MEEP may not do as well with And we have seen thinking, that in the past. So. We've seen both ways. That's true. Okay. That certain tests then, we've seen students that struggle a bit more. We've seen some of the more difficult ones. Some kids excel on those because it's right in, in their wheelhouse as far as the type of questions that mm -hmm. came in. It'll be interesting to see how they set those standards. It's no different. We just went through this. I feel like a broken record here, but we did the College of Career Readiness, and I had to prepare all, for some of you that have been here before, I had to prepare you for all of a sudden our MEEP scores weren't looking like the MEEP mm -hmm. scores of old. It's going to be the same thing all over again. No one's going to know where these are. I hope they're all higher. It's a lot easier to come here when they are. You know, I'm just the messenger, but uh, <laughs> I like when they're higher because that's easier to do. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh -huh. Bob, with the mix of critical thinking and fact-based questions, how will that reflect the same mix in an ACT? Meaning, if I take this exam, well, I'm at school on Saturday, I go take my ACT because I have to, to get them into colleges. Is there going to be a, is the mix going to be about the same? So I'm measuring the same bunches of apples and oranges, or is one of them going to be a bunch of apples and a few oranges, and the other one a whole bunch of oranges and a few apples? I think when you first start always, um, the ACT is a big beast that's slow to change. Yep. And so I don't, I think they will look different. But I think you already see, even in some of the, um, I would use AP as an example, some of the AP tests have slowly started to change to more, I hate to call it smarter balance like, but more of the critical thinking, the application, the less of just here's what I need to know. But some of the tests like the ACT will be slow to change. I mean, it's not that I haven't heard them talk about it and, and they'll say that they're there, but you're right, that will be the, the initial problem. It will be the same, um, it hasn't failed yet. As we try to train kids a certain way, are the college professors looking for anything different or do they want the same thing that they saw before? That's a tough question to answer. I think when you have two big consortiums in the United States running these tests that are very similar in style, you know, uh, pushing the critical thinking, you would hope that the big testing companies wouldn't be far behind. And I haven't heard any noise level at the university level of people wanting to see these new smarter balance assessments versus seeing an ACT. No, I, seen anything? I, no, but I would tell you, I think most instructors would take any kid that can think critically in their classes. R right. I understand the, that. The, the, the testing part for entrance, yeah, I haven't seen any, any cry for a different kind yeah. of test. But I Bob, think they're isn't adapt, it, though. They don't want to be left behind. Take yeah. a word for it. If, if we figure out a way to correlate it so the Smarter Balance becomes a college acceptable test, they'll all be changing. Okay. And Jerry, I've attended a workshop where the ACT people were there they would tell you that they're going to get aligned with Smarter Balance because you want to remember they're a huge national testing company and they're there to make money. And they're not going to get left behind on something, but Bob's right, they've got to sell it to the next level as representing something really credible. Yep. But and they would tell you that they're closer to it than perhaps out in the field we see it being right now. And ACT would tell you, if you talk to their reps, they've sat at the table with Smarter Balance, they're there. Yeah. I mean, there's only so many testing companies, and after a while it's the same people sitting yeah. around <laughs> discussing it. So they all kind of know what's going on. Okay. Bob, yeah. I have a different kind of question. Uh, I'm going to update the board here when you're done about where the state legislature might be in passing next year's school aid budget relative to the Common Core uh, state standards. And if they go away, do you see Smarter Balance going away also? Um, that's, an, that's an interesting question. The interesting thing about that is you got to remember that Smarter Balance is only ELA and math. So the state's already been working on their online versions of science and social studies. Whether it's smart or balanced, I think online testing is coming. I can only speak for math because that's where I've been working pretty heavily the last couple of years. We did not feel that the content difference between Glicks, Huskies, whatever you want to call it currently exists, and the Common Core was very different. That the content was there. Did something jump a grade once in a while? Absolutely. What we thought it did even though in the Glicks and the Huskies you, you, you want to teach those practices, those process skills, it wasn't always, it was kind of like often a separate paragraph. And I think that the Common Core brought those forward. 
I think we need those no matter what. Yeah. Whether the Common Core is here or not, those type of critical thinking skills, all our kids need. 21st century, part of the IB, et cetera. I mean, it's all part of critical thinking. So it's hard to know what they'll do. I mean, they're going to spend the money somehow, which is interesting, and, and they'll be doing it on their own as a state then as opposed to as with a consortium, which there's economic of scale. I mean, if they're writing the test, they can generate test banks in a hurry, huge ones, where the state has struggled with that. In fact, if you know any more, the, the state never releases any test items because otherwise that depletes your bank fast, and there's only so fast you can write them. But when you have 24 states worth of people writing them, you can release more items. Any other questions or comments? I had one that I thought was intriguing, and, and maybe it's because I'm not in tune with third grade uh, English language skills. I saw the math question that was in the third grade test um, have considerable language with it, mm. and not necessarily the simplest of language. And has there been any thought about how the language barrier may impact the assessment of the, of the math skills? In well, the lower do, levels particularly? They do know there's vocabulary that will become an issue. It's a little bit of an issue already, even in the GLEC world, uh, that there are some words that we, we know as math teachers that if the student doesn't click into what that means, can hold them back, even though it's just one word. Um, they do have some capacity. They haven't told us totally how you can use it, but text-to-speech, where you can click on a passage in the Smarter Balance and it will read it <coughs> to you. Um, but whether that is going to require an IEP and a special needs student, whether they're going to let you do that or not, even if it reads it to you, if you don't know what the word means, I don't disagree, there'll be a vocabulary thing. And that's what we normally do after a test is given. Uh, as, as the teachers look at the results, we try to go back. If there's no release items, it's a little tough. But you try to go back and say, what could be holding them up on this problem? And if it's a language issue or a vocabulary word, that would be something that they'd all go back to their classrooms and say, I've just got to say that more. I've got to use it more. I've got to, I've got to phrase problems more that way. So it's something they work on. And I assume this test of the test pilot would not get to that level of assessment. Right. No, you, we'll get nothing back. And even on the field test, we might get nothing back because, like Angela had said, they really want that data to set some standards with. So how much they'll give back, if they give back at a district level, it's, it's hard to say. It could be like the NAEP test, which, yeah, they give you some natural, national results, but they don't give you anything uh, locally. States as close as you get. So that would just depend. Any well, let me share kind of a tangentially related item to this. Yeah. See, um, Mike Flanagan, our state superintendent of schools, released a uh, memo today, a press release, where he addresses the fact that, I uh, want to remember, as the state budget progresses, um, it gets agreed to in each chamber, the House and the Senate. And when they get close and it passes, um, it goes to a conference committee, which is a combination of the two, and then a version of that ends up uh, on the governor's desk. Um, included in that conference agreement is um, some language that prevents the Michigan Department of Education from uh, spending any dollars out of next year's budget in support of the Common Core state standards. That is huge, and Flanagan, Roger even saw a copy of it. He's been in contact with Kathy and I today. That really puts a dead end stop to work for three years in the state of Michigan on implementing the Common Core standards. We aren't panicking. We talked about it very briefly in agenda this morning because we have a very strong, rigorous curriculum here at Midland Public Schools. We need to stay the path and tweak it as we may and what we think our students will be prepared for the Common Core State Standards if it moves forward. The problem is, and this is as of 3.30 today, the House okayed the omnibus budget bill, and I just want to read the first paragraph to you. Uh, for all parts of the state government, it was approved this afternoon just from the House minus higher education, community colleges, and school aid today, thus wrapping up its work on the 13-14 fiscal budget. The Senate adjourned today before taking action on this. It's anticipated they'll take action in the a.m. on Wednesday morning. So if you feel strongly about the Common Core State Standards, and I do, I think it's a step in the right direction. It creates a benchmark almost nationwide that I think is good for school districts to have. It's a statement about education in this country that I think is healthy, that we have a little bit of control over as educators when you compare our performance, even adjusting for poverty levels and so on with other countries. There's, it can lead to more accurate international comparisons, I think. What I think is absolutely inexcusable is that something like this would end up in a conference committee without legislators reaching out to educators 
specifically in our community, our school district, and I'm not aware that they've reached out elsewhere uh, in the county. But John shared a story. I won't um, embarrass the legislator who was involved, but they just met last week. I, I ran into him downtown, and John was assured by this legislator that this would not be in the agreement in the conference committee, and it's there, and it's bad education. And if our community cares about quality education, they ought to be calling Jim Stamas and John Molinar and weighing in on continuing the Common Core state standards because we are right on the brink of them going away. Interesting. Any questions or comments to that? Okay, we'll move on. Um, 4.3 District 2012 Safety Excellence Boards. Now this is just something that we did not want to let by with giving some recognition uh, really to our employees here in the district. So um, it gives our Midland Public School Safety Committee great pleasure to inform the board and our public that we've had four district buildings that have completed the 2012 year without recording any employee injuries. I mean, that's pretty amazing when you think about it with all the things we ask our employees to do. So these buildings are Woodcrest Elementary School, the Administration Center, so kudos to everybody that works here, the Bus Garage, which when you think about it is no easy task, and the Franklin Center. And so award certificates were presented to the building staff on April 29th, a month ago. We're really proud of that. We strive to do more. It seems like we always come in with anywhere from four to six buildings that have kind of like a perfect record when it comes to uh, accidents and and. I just think we need to uh, celebrate that. And, and kudos to the staff and those respective buildings. They've done a fine job this year. And ultimately, that saves us money when you think about it, uh, people being off of work and any liabilities that are involved. So it's a great thing. And I, we just wanted to mention that publicly. Comments? I, hey, I'd like to salute those four buildings, but I also like to lay out a challenge to anybody who might be listening. If the bus garage, where is our most mechanical, hands-on operation, can have zero accidents, I would challenge all of our other academic buildings to look at the belly button a little bit and say, why can't we do that? Um, so it's just a challenge there that uh, if the bus garage can do it, it's, it's proven that anybody in this district can do it. And uh, hats off to the bus garage with their highly mechanical and potentials for accidents for being very safe. So. And thanks also to the safety committee because they're the one that track it. You know, they develop the awards. It's a small uh, handful group of people, but they do wonderful work for us. So I want to thank them as well. Okay, that brings us around to why many of our guests are here this evening to, uh, to take action on approval of the County Educational Service Agency 2013-14 budget, which was uh, briefly reviewed with us this evening. Um, we all had the details in, in some of our packets. Um, I guess I would entertain a motion, then read the resolution um, to approve. So can I have a motion to approve the budget for the ESA? So I move that we approve action item 4.4, approving the ESA budget. Moved by Member Treasurer, a second? Second. By, by Member Gorton. Um, before we have discussion and any more questions amongst ourselves, Mr. Secretary, can you read it? Absolutely. Um, this, I will be reading the ISD budget resolution support for budget. Uh, Midland Public Schools, Midland, Michigan. A regular meeting of the Board of Education of the district was held in the MPS boardroom in the district on the 28th of May, 2013 at 7 p.m. at uh, 7, 7 p.m. or 7 o'clock in the evening. Okay. The meeting was called to order by President Jerry Wasserman. Uh, those were present. Um, I can go ahead and read uh, through that there. Everybody is present except for uh, Member uh, McFarland. That'll work. That'll, That'll work. work. Okay, yeah, very good. I can go through the names. Uh, the following preamble and resolution were offered by Member Branstan and supported by Member Gordon. Uh, whereas, number one, uh, Section 624 of the Revised School Code, as amended, requires the Intermediate School Board to submit its proposed budget no later than May 1st of each year to the Board of each constituent district for review. And number two, not later than June 1st of each year, the board of each constituent district shall review the proposed intermediate school district budget, uh, shall adopt a board resolution expressing its support or uh, support for or disapproval of the proposed intermediate school district budget, and shall submit to the intermediate school board any specific objections and proposed changes the constituent district board um, has uh, to the budget. 
Now, therefore, it be, be it resolved that, number one, the Board of Education has received and reviewed the proposed intermediate school district budget in accordance with Section 624 of the Revised School Code as amended, and by the adoption of this resolution expressed its support for the proposed intermediate school district budget. Number two, the Secretary of the Board of Education or his or her designee shall forward a copy of this resolution to the Intermediate School Board or its superintendent no later than June 1, 2013. Uh, number three, all resolutions insofar as they conflict with this resolution B and the same are hereby rescinded. Um, and I believe we have a vote. A vote. Um, before we do a vote, any questions or comment on the motion? Just to say, Jerry, that administratively we recommend that you support this. So we appreciate that. And I have one comment for, for our guests. Uh, thank you. You've worked hard over the last several years of, I'll call it, bringing the fund balances back into a more balanced state. Um, when we were doing big economic uh, upheavals in the districts, also appreciate how you've worked on the cost and the transparency over the years, um, several years back. I mean, more than several years back, we had some concerns that were voiced here, and you guys have been listening to those, so I said thank you for that. Okay. I, I just have one thing to add. Thank you for what you do for special education students and for, uh, for many school districts that have different needs, like you said, Mr. Sorrells in the county. So take the roll call vote. Sure can. President Wasserman? Yes. Vice President Baker? Yes. Secretary Kaminsky? I'm a yes. Treasurer Brandstant? Yes. Member Gordon? Yes. Member Vanderkellen? Yes. And Member McFarland is absent. And while it is not in a vote or a proxy, I want to make, I should have said something a little earlier. Um, uh, Member McFarland did speak with me today and wanted me to express that he does support this, even though it's not a vote, just so folks know that. Last part of the resolution is the resolution is declared adopted. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Honored guests. Appreciate it. Okay, we'll move on to item five, curriculum and instruction, and I'll hand it to Lynn for a uh, study or yeah, yep. study committee report. And I am actually deferring that to uh, Yvonne since I was absent. not there. Okay, we met Monday, May twenty first at the building building trades house on East Haley Street. Uh, the building trades teacher, Kevin Dodick, and two students, Michael Lowry and Cody Bauer, discussed the overall building trades project and partnership for the 2012-2013 school year. This year's partnership included the City of Midland and the Reese Endeavor of Midland. The 22 students enrolled in the building trades program met the challenge of completing the 2,322-foot square duplex-style residence on East Haley Street. Both sides of the duplex were constructed with a universal design to meet the needs of a variety of potential residents. The entire residence was built in compliance with the American Disabilities Act standards as a handicap accessible, barrier free, and zero step home. In the final weeks of the school year, students will be putting the final touches on the interior and exterior of the home and property. That was really a good visit. The students were really um, proud of their accomplishment and they were really happy to show us around and it was really amazing what they've done there. So it was very nice. So this program, like how much of their day do they spend working uh, on this if they're in that program? Like two hours a day was, or, or an hour and a half, maybe half hour traveling back and forth. Okay. And it was amazing what they could get done in mm -hmm. such a short time. Yeah, that's why I was wondering by the time you get really there, Really well start. done, too. If any of you wanted a tour through the building, we could set it up. It is. I've wandered over in a day right. when, just, when you're just wandering around and mm -hmm. check it out the last several years. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. It really is. Yeah. And, and they'll have residents lined up for this building soon, or? I think they do a, already, isn't that right, Kevin? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that what they said? It's the Reese Endeavor, mm -hmm. and the Reese Endeavor just pays for the cost of the materials, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and they're able to. I yeah. remember when I was on CAS, we toured one of the buildings, and one of the recipients was there for a zero-step design. Mm. And it was really neat talking to the resident on how valuable the layout and the design of that building was to them maintaining their independence, living alone. Big three O doors and everything. Mm -hmm. Great yep. window. Yep. Any other questions? Miss this that I'll hand it over to Kathy. Okay. For thank her you. Third to the last report. To us. <laughs> yes, really. Uh, thank you. Uh, the building trades house. I'm sorry that I missed that this year, but it's a. I just know. Well, we were at Big Boy for dinner, and when you look over, you can see that they were finishing up the last of the siding. So. It's amazing to think of the differences since we paired up with Reese Endeavor, actually, and have gone to those specific changes and, and uh, observed that over time. 
there are many houses in Midland that have been built with the building trades house many, many years. Tonight I also have uh, something else that's kind of uh, annual. I come to you with our finished improvement plans. The district, as well as each building, is required by Public Act 335 to create an improvement plan. Um, these are developed on the continuous improvement process. That means that the data is collected annually. We reflect on the data, ask how are we doing in getting toward our goals. We collect demographic, academic, and perceptual data at the building level as well as at the district level. And the District School Improvement Committee, which has its look-alike items in each building, actually puts together the district plan. So the district plan is built by the District Improvement Committee, and uh, Kim is our board member serving this year. Many of you have spent some time on the district improvement plan, so you know how this works. But we put that together and bring along our new members so they can get a feel for how that works. And then uh, at the last meeting, we read the building plans, and that's what we did last week. While you were here on Thursday night doing some important business, we met at Carpenter and read through all of the plans, which are here in front of me. The committee members who I had, um, I think there were 12 people there. And of those 12 people, three were school people. The rest were parents and community members. So we had lots of people there, and their background was not education. They were prepared and read through the plans, gave some feedback. And now with that vetting, I'm bringing them to you. They will go back to the building for a bit of a fine tuning. And if any of you would like to see them or anyone else, they will be available outside my office. They'll have some last minute uh, observations that they will consider from the committee, make any changes that they like, and then they will resubmit them electronically. And then I will upload them to the state following your approval, which is required by law. We have made a few changes this year that I'd like to just mention to you because the buildings work very, very hard and getting these plans put together. We spend at least four days in recent time when we meet in all of these rooms, and the buildings come and often will bring their full committees. They might bring 8, 10, 12 people, and they'll spend a half day or a day here talking over their data, talking over their uh, objectives and their goals, asking how are they coming, uh, really looking into the question of what should we do next to close the achievement gap because everyone is working toward getting 100% of our students proficient. Whether we have a common core state standards or the GLICs, we have agreed here on what our students need to know and be able to do. And so whether that's common core, whether it's GLICs, or whether it's what we decide that we want our students to know and be able to do, that's what we base our school improvement plans on, both the building and the district. So we'd like to just assure you that reflected in all of these plans is all of us striving to close the achievement gaps, whether it's with special education students or our economically disadvantaged students. We are all working hard to get our students achieving at a level which will have them college and career ready, regardless of what the legislature decides to do with their newest name that they're giving us. So I hope that maybe some of you will take a look at this, and you certainly it will be online. They are always online at the website. They are required to be online as soon as you approve them and they are submitted. So I will bring them back at the next meeting and ask your approval for them at that time. I encourage your parents or buildings to look at them online, too, to see if they can yeah. Actually, when the members of the district school improvement, I never give them the plan for the building that their child attends because I encourage them to look at a different one and then encourage them to go back and look at their own buildings plan as well so that they have two different views of the same process. And it's pretty eye-opening for folks. Okay. Any questions? Two students yeah. serve on that committee also, by the way, one from each high school. So if uh, any of you are interested in another year, you know what, just let uh, Dr. Ellison know. And Typically, it would be Mr. Cooper. <laughs> Mr. Cooper, yeah. <laughs> Typically, what we hear from the students is they had no idea this kind of planning, intentional planning, went on behind the scenes to orchestrate your great achievement that you have here. So, mm -hmm. in fact, I have encouraged all of the building principals, especially at the secondary level, after seeing the um, fine contributions our three students give us, it is amazing the insights that they have. 
and um, the secondary folks would would be well served to have those students give them feedback on the kinds of programs that we have. So actually, you should talk with your principal. <laughs> okay, thank you. Any questions for Kathy? Okay, we will we will move on and turn it over to Ms. Klein. We'll begin with the gifts that we've already received and processed. They total $7,324.29. <coughs> You'll notice the first two indicate that they've been deferred for 2013-14. That means that the gift has been made in this fiscal year, but we don't intend to spend the money until the next fiscal year, so it will be carried over and fund balanced. We always when you see the budget for next year you'll see that little line item and fund balance that says gifts and contributions this is in part what goes into it gifts that come in now so that we may begin spending the money on July 1st so the first is from the National Energy Foundation and it supports the think energy program in collaboration with consumers energy and this will be used at Adams Elementary Second is from the East Lawn Elementary PTO, who is ahead of all th their peers this year in making their donation for Scholastic News for East Lawn for the 13-14 school year. Uh, the remaining gifts are for this year. The first is from the H.H. Dow High School Athletic Booster Club, providing uniforms for the baseball program. The Midland High School Athletic Booster Club, trainer supplies, again, for the athletic program. And then gifts from Timothy and Pamela Nash and Wolverine Bank, both to support the 2013 prom, which was held uh, a couple of weekends ago. The next gift requires your action. It is for $6,876.67, and it is from the Midland High School Athletic Booster Club, and it is to cover all of the costs for the fall sports regular season entry fees. The athletic director worked with the boosters this year and decided that that was something that they wanted to do, freeing up the money that would have been budgeted out of the general fund for those items to be used on some of the types of things that they might have otherwise purchased as gifts. So uh, they decided the easiest way to go was for the athletic department to pay their fees, capture what those amounts were, and then more or less present them with a bill. So we would request your approval of that gift this evening. So is that from last fall or this coming fall? That is for last fall. All right. I want to move, okay. a, move approval of acceptance of the gift uh, from the Midland High School Athletic Booster Club. Moved by Secretary Kaminsky. Any support? Support. Support by Treasurer Branstad. Any discussion on the donation? Other than the obvious, thank you. Yeah. Total of donations for the year, uh, Linda? I don't have that in front of me right now. Two hundred sixty-eight thousand six dollars and one penny. Wow! Well, a quarter of a million. Thanks dollars. to the community. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, all in favor of this motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, Linda. All right. The next item is something that we do every two or three years. And this year it required a little bit more research and deliberation than usual. You heard the presentation on the safety committee, and that was fortuitous that that was made this evening because that has a direct link to keeping our workers' compensation costs low. Uh, we are well regarded by our insurance carrier for our low incidence of expensive claims. And I think it's in great part because of the attention that our safety committee shines onto the area of employee safety. Uh, we have for a number of years worked with citizens management. As a district, we are self-insured, uh, similar to the way we handle our medical insurance. And then we have to purchase what on the medical side we would call stop loss. On the workers' comp side is called excess claims insurance. Uh, Citizens has now been acquired by York Risk Services Company, uh, but there continues to be a third-party administrator that was associated with them based in Howell. Our contract with CMI does expire on June 30th, so we went to Bailey Insurance, who has been our insurer for a number of years, and asked them to get uh, bids on our behalf. And what we discovered is that due to some changes that have nothing to do with us per se. First is increasing medical costs nationally, and the second are changes in Medicare that 
require setting aside more money to cover longer Medicare costs. My notes from the meeting refer to the longer tail of Medicare. Uh, the cost of excess insurance has gone up. Now, this is a fairly small part of our budget, uh, but because of the significant increase of the excess, we looked at it more carefully this year than we would in the past, and even questioned whether we should consider leaving self-insurance, which apparently a number of smaller employers are doing, <coughs> and school districts. Uh, what we learned is that because of our favorable claims, we still, although we will have to pay $40,000 for the two years of coverage, uh, we still are looked on pretty favorably, and our deductible is considerably lower than most districts are required to carry. And if we were to drop our self-funding, it would cost us more. And there's no guarantee that should we want to return to the self-funded workers' comp, that we would then be granted the lower deductible again. Uh, our deductible or the self-insured retention is $350,000 for a single claim, and the aggregate is in excess of $700,000. So we're bringing to you, uh, actually it's a combined proposal, it's for two years, an annual premium of $40,355 for the excess insurance coverage with Safety National Casualty Corporation, and they were the lower bidder of those that bid on the aggregate, uh, as well as a premium of $10,220 for TPA, which is third-party administration, annual services, and that provides claims administration and managed care cost review by CMI. So we are recommending a two-year contract with CMI and Safety National for workers' comp and the next time we renew, we will look at it again to see whether we should continue with this or whether we should go to self-insured. But just for uh, comparison purposes, the cost of straight-up premium-based program would have been $158,000. Hmm. So this is still the more cost-effective of the two ways. Entertain a motion. So moved. Moved by Member Baker. Support. Support by Treasurer Brandstad. Um, any comment or question for Linda? Good job. Yeah, my only comment is that I like how we do the approach on both of these the stop loss and mm -hmm. take a little risk, don't take big risks. So thank you. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. We'll move to uh, Human Resources and to Mr. Valendi. Thank you, Mr. Wasserman. The board and the staff extend their deepest sympathy to the family of Mrs. Margaret Cook, who passed away on May 19, 2013. Mrs. Cook was manager of accounts payable when she retired in 1977. She worked for the Minnesota Public Schools for 19 years. We can go on to technology. Um, we'll go on to technology. Okay, for action. Administration is requesting approval to deliver a purchase order to Trivalent of Granville, Michigan for $66,983 for the re uh, replacement backup system. Uh, our current backup system is four years old, almost out of storage space, and is no longer covered under the original maintenance contract. Uh, you should understand that archive technology has changed a great deal in the last two years and has become cheaper to replace our existing solution uh, than to add to it. The new backup system includes uh, Unitrend's recovery backup appliance, external archiving with removable drives and carriers, and a five-year maintenance and support contract. Uh, you also need to understand that 65% of our archive David, uh, data is server data and not user-created data. Archive remains a vital component to the district's disaster recovery and operational needs. Funds for this uh, purchase have been allocated in the current school year budget. So should we uh, suffer some kind of calamity um, to our system, we would have a recovery system in place that is, uh, continues to be reliable. This is a top priority at this point. Our discussion, can I have a motion? I move that we approve Oop. item 8.1. Moved by Treasurer Branstadt, uh, second or support? Support. Support by Secretary Kaminsky. Uh, discussion or questions for Gary? And 
the amount of the Dow's uh, disaster recovery a little bit. Uh, these are vital, okay. vital the day it happens. <laughs> okay, no questions or comments. Uh, we'll move into a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, you'll see a list of, uh, in the agenda, a list of correspondence to and from the Board of Education. In addition, a listing of our uh, future meetings. There are two left while Carl and Kathy are still with us. And uh, so those who care to watch them in action the last two meetings, here's your chance. <laughs> um, <Exciting stuff. laughs> at this point, we'll move into a study discussion session, and I'll begin to my right tonight. Yeah. Oh, um, one item I wanted to bring up in honor of the soldiers again and the veterans and fallen soldiers and remind us that we're here for a greater cause is I would like to move that our students say the Pledge of Allegiance uh, each morning. It's passed as a law and it will start next fall, beginning of the school year. So. And, and, and when would you move for this to start? To as clear? soon as possible. Is there... Are the flags in the classrooms yet? I don't know if they're all there yet. Are they all in? Well, I think the flags are there. I, I would... It certainly is worthy of discussion, Kim. Um, I mean, patriotism is something that's really important. My recommendation, though, is I wouldn't just drop this by board, surprise board action on your administrators in the last three weeks of a school year. Yeah. I mean, kids, for those of us who have served as building administrators, um, you begin disrupting a routine this close to when the weather gets hot and humid and the end of the school year, and you can create unanticipated issue so um, it, if you go down this path I think it might be prudent for you to say to administrators if we were to consider this are there other implications that we haven't thought of bring that back to us I mean give us some time instead of surprising us um, well the, the law has passed and starting in the fall it is the law, so yeah. it would be nice to start it as close to Memorial Day as possible. Yeah. But, but you, I don't think you're right. If we'd like to ask the principal, it'd be wonderful. And if you could report back to us next time. Yeah, I, I don't think you want to put. I think I think the uh, bill administration looking surprises for the surprises of, like that are yeah. mm -hmm. the not good minute. ideas this time of year. Yeah, Anytime. And, and if you could come back with uh, the building administrator's thoughts, not only on now but also on implementation for next year, and as you mentioned, other potential snags that may be there to comply with the law. Yeah. to make sure we do that in the right way, that would be best. Well, well, my recommendation would be that you not do it this year. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I mean, think about it. Um, we don't meet again for two weeks. Then you'd be changing a routine for right. youngsters with a week and a half of school Seven left. Days, yeah. Or even less than that, I guess. It, um, yeah. With the last day of school is when the 12th, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's 11th for the students. Yeah. 12th. Oh, yes, the 12th. So if we took level. action on the 10th, you know, <laughs> I, I think our principals know. Gary's had conversation that it's coming uh, in the fall and so on. But it, I don't think you'd drop it on them with just a couple weeks' notice. What, what's the board's preference? So I'll just poll everybody and set up a vote. Kim, would you like to move now? Uh, yeah, as soon as possible. I would like Lynn? to. I, I agree that we need we should respect the the input from the administrators and give it a little time. I think we should give it time. Mm. I'd like some administrator input from the building principals. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good idea, but I don't think at mm -hmm. this point of the year that it's something we want to. It's, it's a very, it's I don't, a very, I don't very warming thought. I'd right. also duplicate yeah. Angela's comment. Right. I think it's a yeah, great idea. Yeah, definitely a great idea. But I don't like to. Well, and it is only one minute out of the day, but I think it's an important minute. But. We can different. get the feedback from the principals yeah. if we need I don't that. want to dictate what Well, can, can I just clarify for me, yeah. though? Because, I mean, my preference is you not ask us to do anything with it because it's going to happen in the fall. Mm -hmm. No. And Gary's preparing. Right. But if you yeah. say go back and research and come back to me on the 10th and tell me if we're going to do it for two days. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I, it's more uh, can you give us some advance heads up what the issues would be for doing it next fall? Well, I, well we have to do it next fall. We have fall. to do it next fall. So go ahead. Uh, I can tell you we've had discussions on this uh, before. I've been working with the principals, person helping to secure the funding for the flags, inventorying what rooms are going to be used for instruction and making sure that those uh, flags um, 
have been secured thanks to uh, the many gifts that we got throughout the community and they have been put up in the classrooms. But there have been issues, some questions, especially at the secondary. This is not uncommon at all. In the elementary, they've dealt with it and they do deal with it over the announcements. Well, secondary building is a very, very uh, different type of uh, atmosphere, especially you get students going back and forth between uh, buildings. Uh, you have issues that uh, you're going to have some students have already indicated it in uh, uh, school newspapers that they don't want to do it, but it is the law, et cetera. Well, you can't require them to no, do no, it either. Well, well, that, I mean, that's, that's exactly where the issues you, come in. Yeah, I'm not trying to be obstructionist, no, Kim. No. I'm just saying that. That's why I want to know I the mean, Rick land Snyder land. does address that, and he, does, he says to give the kids an opportunity to say yeah. the Pledge right. of Allegiance. But, and if right. You aren't uh, a U.S. citizen, or your parents don't want you to say, yeah. you can remain. Yeah. Watching well, the and the students, we know that that's part of the law, and we've had discussion that it is not required. Okay, the, the buildings, uh, uh, though, have talked about. Okay, so are we going to do this by um, <clears throat> uh, the PA announcement? So that we don't have a substitute come in, doesn't follow the procedure, et cetera, and we've got problems there. Or are we going to do it in each first hour class and the teacher leads it in those particular circumstances? Is the student going to be expected to stand? Or uh, if they don't want to participate, can they uh, sit? Those types of issues. And we want to be fair and honor the spirit of the law uh, and the letter of the law. But we, st we still are working through some of those things. Uh, nobody in the uh, principal's ranks are opposed to this at all. Right. But if there's more management issues at the uh, um, secondary level than uh, there would be at the elementary. And in all honesty, we need to send something out to our parents before we do it, yeah, exactly. especially if we were to do I'm it before that. the law requires, because our community has some parents who will probably have some children that may not participate, mm -hmm. and we need to reassure them on how we're going to handle that. So if we wait until the fall, I think we have an opportunity to do it right. If we did it now, I'd be a little concerned about Good that. Good question. Yeah. So it would be great to study what we should offer for the kids who aren't U.S. citizens at that time. Yeah. Okay, so if you folks will report back, not this year necessarily, but for the next school year so that we have a policy in place and we know how everybody's going to behave in the buildings yeah. as we go forward. That may or may not be you. <laughs> 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 Recognize the timeline we're on. Uh, but, uh, but let's do that so we do it in a systematic way that uh, we don't create landmines that we didn't mean to create. Okay. Anything else, Kim? Anything I'm, else? Anything no, else? I'm set. Okay. All righty. Uh, just a couple comments. First, I, I would thank the um, everybody from the ESA, John, and your staff. I thought you did a wonderful presentation. Easy to understand, and I appreciate the innovation and the, that you're using as you're uh, working on your budget and the challenges that all of us are working on. So I look forward to working with you in the future. Uh, and Bob Cooper as well. Bob always does a great job in presenting uh, presenting updates on um, what's happening at the state and national level with our testing. Nothing ever says, well, I should say, it doesn't surprise us that they're always surprising us. So thanks for, for your uh, <laughs> presentation. Uh, then just a couple other little things. I was at Midland High today for their Chemic Connection and uh, had the privilege to uh, have the five students that went to Taipei, Taiwan, and one of the teachers was there to uh, give just a little beginning presentation, and I understand they will be at our board meeting in June, so I'm looking forward to that. But what an incredible opportunity we have been able to support um, here at Midland Public Schools, and uh, thanks to all the generous uh, donors that helped make that happen. And let's see, I also, while, while I was there, found out that the elementary track meet was canceled today, and that, those of us that have had elementary students or do, that is a huge event that those kids look forward to, and uh, I know they're disappointed, but uh, also thank you to all the staff and the parents and the volunteers that uh, put so much effort into preparing for this uh, event. So hopefully this is it and it won't uh, affect you in years to come. And also looking forward to, um, I'm not able to go, but I read that Midland High's baseball team is supposed to go to Comerica Park to play tomorrow. So hopefully that will, that will occur. I know they're excited and looking forward to that great opportunity. And lastly, uh, good luck to all our uh, future graduates. They have a few days of school left and uh, so try to stay focused and enjoy that, and I will look forward to seeing some of 
some of you Midland High uh, graduates, or all of you, at commencement. Yvonne. Well, we recently learned that in Newsweek's 2013 high school rankings, both Midland and Dow High received the silver medal recognition. And so because of that, I would like to give credit where I think credit is due tonight and say a big thank you to our excellent teaching staff. I think they really make all the difference here in Midland. We have some very high achievers here, and I think we really owe a lot of our thanks for that to our teachers. Um, and as a parent who has had one child graduate from Midland High and another one soon to do the same thing, I uh, just want to offer my personal thanks. I think uh, I'm, I just want to say, too, that I'm really grateful they had the opportunity to be educated in the Midland Public Schools because I think it will be a benefit to them all their lives. So thank you, teachers. Thank you. John. Okay. Um, you know, congratulations um, to those buildings that had the Safety Excellence Awards. It's just really a great achievement. Um, and thanks for those that served on that committee uh, gathering and tracking the data. And then thanks to all the, uh, all the parents and uh, teachers and administrators that served on school improvement. I know it's a long process. I've gone through that a few years uh, myself. But uh, thanks for the evening hours and all the extra time trying to improve uh, Midland Public Schools. And uh, thank you to our donors and our, our, those that gave gifts to the, um, to the district. It's impressive being over a quarter million dollars. just really shows the support um, behind Midland Public Schools. And it really is touching. Yeah. All right, well, a lot has been going on. We've been spending a lot of time here. Um, tomorrow we're going on our site visit down to Algonac, and I want to thank all the um, staff at Midland Public and all the community members that have agreed to go with us down there. Um, also, I know tonight I'm once again missing an orchestra concert of my daughter's, but um, I know all those are coming on, uh, going on right now, so I'm hoping everyone's enjoying all the end-of-the-year programming it's that um, programming that is happening and um, also best of luck to all the graduates I'm looking forward I'll be at Dow High this year and I'm um, looking forward to once again that was such a special um, experience last year my first time I'm um, getting to hand out diplomas and I'm very much looking forward to it again this year thank you back to me um, just a little more on the um, superintendent search uh, Thursday evening we learned to announce mr. Sharrow's our our uh, finalist and we learned we'd go into a site visit two hours away instead of over 10 hours away and spent Friday before the holiday weekend uh, organizing it as we committed to and had volunteers volunteer to to go with us and I'll read those names here in a minute and just wanted to shout out to some folks that over Saturday and Sunday some of our volunteers uh, sadly experienced a death in their respective families uh, that understandably precludes them from going so our sympathies are with them and the reason I mention it is that three people since Sunday night have rearranged their schedules for Wednesday to be able to participate. And I just wanted to shout out to those people with the, I'll call it super last minute adjustment of their calendars uh, that they were able to do that with short notice. So it was really heartwarming to see, uh, I will tell you the response uniformly from every person to go, and I think the district needs to hear this, was not, oh, I'll see what I can do. It was, oh, thank you. I'd love to do this. Let me see what I can do to change my calendar. People were really enthused to want to go do that, and I loved, uh, loved seeing that out of our community. Um, and so I'll announce uh, tonight uh, who is going. Uh, myself as chair <coughs> for the last meeting, uh, Lynn Baker as per the last meeting, and Angela Branstadt representing the board members as, as per the last meeting. And then I looked for a cross-section at all the various levels and all the various areas of town and uh, Midland High School Principal Janet Greif will be going with us. Uh, Jefferson Middle School teacher and Gerstacker Award winner Kelly Bays. Uh, East Lawn parent uh, Cindy Smerden. The MCA president Vi Cowan. A former MPS board member with experience in selecting three MPS superintendents, uh, Rick Oley. Uh, the Legacy Center director Jan Hieronima. The uh, VP of facilities for Mid Michigan Med Center and an MPS parent, Mike Erickson. And lastly, uh, HH Dow Foundation Director, Janae Velasquez. However, Janae is likely not to be joining us. Um, and she just called me tonight that she may have a conflict that she cannot avoid. So I uh, don't want to be uh, presumptuous that she's going to show. She most likely will not uh, be able to go. So that's the, that's the committee who will be going on the site visit. Uh, as a reminder, our next special meeting is Thursday at 5 p.m. 
where this group will report out briefly to us any major findings that they have found that may be different than we have found in our process so far. And uh, at that point, we'll do a final vote on the selection of Mr. Sharp. And we have uh, those that may not be going on the visit have reference checks. Yes, I'm sorry. Thank you for we mentioning do, that. Do you have homework. your homework. <laughs> you have a lot of homework because each yeah. of you got four ish, yeah. I think it was. Uh, he supplied more than the 14, and uh, so you all have plenty of homework mm -hmm. to go after in the meantime. Thank you. So we'll have lots of reference checks, we'll have lots of personal interviews. Mm -hmm. So we should have a pretty good bundle of information as we make our final decision. That said, I'll hand it over to Carl. Uh, just some student and staff recognitions to uh, end this meeting from Midland High School. Uh, MITES, M-I-T-E-S, stands for the Michigan Industrial and Technology Education Society. Corey Pollack is our welding teacher at Midland High and has only been with MPS for two years, and he's done just a terrific job of building the welding club and the MITE activities. This is by far the best showing we've ever had in a competition. Congratulations to the middle high school students for this success, their success at this year's state competition. Matt Clark, Kevin Valeski uh, took first at states. John Nirenberg, uh, Nick Keel took second at states. So we're just really proud of these kids and, and their teacher. Um, also at um, Midland High School, congrats to the MHS girls track team as they won the Valley Championship meet last week. Congratulations to all the team members on a very successful season. The same go out to their coach, Diane Sugnett, for being voted the Saginaw Valley League Coach of the Year. At Dow High School, um, uh, this was turned into us. This year's prom was organized by the Midland High Class Advisors, Mark Calamari and Angie Kerr, and Dow High Class Advisors, uh, Jamie Cressman and Ted Davis. 779 students came to the Valley Plaza Great Hall on May 18th for an evening of underwater enchantment. Students enjoyed door prizes and beautiful decorations made possible from donations from Wolverine Bank and Northwood Institute, uh, Northwood University's Tim Nash. The dance floor and tables were packed for, with students for most of the evening. That's a good thing. Uh, Monday morning, rave reviews of the prom could be heard in the halls of both high schools. The evening would not have been as wonderful if it hadn't been for the amazing support from our community, parents, staff, and the students that helped out. And then for some of the adults that work here, Midland Public Schools wants to offer our congratulations to Kathy Snyder. This year's H.H. Dow High School Saginaw Valley League Teacher of the Year and to Will Luzar, this year's Midland High School Saginaw Valley League Teacher of the Year. Well-deserved honors to do very two very special MPS staff members. So nice note to uh, get close to ending the year on. Thank you, Carl. Anything else for the good of the order? Seeing none. We are adjourned. <laughs>